So I watch a lot of Russian state media and read RT and TASS and Pravda to try to get inside the Russian mindset. Vladimir Solyov is one of the chief propagandists and he's like schizophrenic. And I don't mean schizophrenic like he's clinically diagnosed that way. But he says things like Russia is so mighty and great and yet everybody's always trying to destroy Russia and we've got to guard against, right, simultaneously. Or he says that we're this, but it's actually a smoke and mirrors. It's what his opponents are. Or it's a really weird, like he says some things that are like actually quite spot on and then some things that are in just la la land. And, and, and trying to understand the differences between them is really interesting. So we're going to watch this as he's talking about um, how the West wants to tear Russia apart and that sort of thing. But just listen to it and I'll stop periodically to unpack what he's saying. So he just finished talking about the hurricane. He says, and now about war. Yesterday, we started to talk about this topic. It should always be understood what war is all about. When they say war, what is it all about? Well, first, he's not supposed to use the word war. He's supposed to be using the word special military operation or the term special military operation rather than war. You can go to jail for calling the SMO a war. In the end, it's all about victory. Now, I think he's kind of right that in the end, what you're after is victory. It's not all about victory. You have to get there the right way, but he's kind of on the right track. What is victory? How does each side view victory? You can convince yourself that all wars end with peace. Well, maybe perhaps peace follows war, but any peace ends with war. Any peace ends with war? Now, he's the same guy that was saber rattling the other day talking about how the natural state of man is a state of war. Now, that may have been true over time, and historically, humans are pretty terrible to each other, but is this really what you want to be striving for or saying, like, you know, the problem is we got too soft, we should be more warlike? Is that really where you want to go? So this phrase does not explain anything, he says. Do all wars end at the negotiating table? No. Not all wars end at the negotiating table. We know quite many wars that ended with total destruction of the other side. A number of wars still have not ended at the negotiating table, and there was no signed peace deal. For example, has anyone seen a peace deal between Russia and Japan? There can be acts of capitulation, though. But often, an act of capitulation, like the one signed in an infamous train carriage, leads to World War I spilling into World War II. So he's talking about the Versailles Treaty and that sort of thing, and, and uh, Germany having to take really bad terms that led to a generation later leading to World War II. That's why a vision of victory is important, as well as a military understanding of what is the end of a war. Now he's right about this. You have to understand what the end of the war should look like in order to be able to know if you've gotten it. For example, Russia is clearly formulating what the end of the war means to us. All of our goals are easy to understand and can be computed in military terms. When we say our goal is to reach the constitutional borders of the Russian Federation, everyone understands that a certain number of square kilometers has to be liberated. Now here he's talking about constitutional borders of the Russian Federation after the illegal annexation of four territories within Ukraine. So getting to the to the constitutional borders of uh, Donetsk and Luhansk and Herzan and etc. Right. So that's what he's talking about here. And he's saying that that's a goal. That's a war aim. OK. Ukraine is doing exactly the opposite, still reaching those constitutional borders, but in reverse all the way to the border of Russia of square kilometers that has to be liberated, which resources are needed for this, human and material resources. If we say that our goal is to reach the Atlantic Ocean, like, wait, why is he saying that? Because he's talked about that before. We ought to bomb everything between here and the Atlantic Ocean and just take that land, right? <laughs> I've seen him say that kind of thing. This is a different goal. Ukraine declares, our goal is to return to the 1991 borders. Okay, now that is a legitimate goal of Ukraine. And returning to the 1991 borders is what they're trying to achieve since both the 2022 and 2014 invasions. Let's calculate what are the 1991 borders. This means Crimea. Donbass, Zaporizhia, Herzon regions are supposed to end up as part of Ukraine? Exactly. That's right. That is what you were stealing from your neighbor, and that's what needs to be returned so that you can rejoin the family of nations as a full participant. But short of that, you should be sanctioned into oblivion. You should be um, seen as a threat that you are to the other nations around you. 
Ukraine thinks that with its population of 30 million, they can occupy the territories where 8 to 10 million people live. Now, that's really interesting because so far he said some pretty okay stuff, some interesting stuff. I mean, I know he came from the wrong point of view, but he was in line with reality. But then, then he starts talking about how Ukraine would have to occupy the Donbass as if these are all pro-Russian speakers and they're all just wanting to be one with Russia and how are you going to occupy these 8 to 10 million people? So let's reverse this. How can Russia occupy this? Like if you, let's do a thought experiment. If you took away all the military presence out of Ukraine, like you just lifted them up in the air, including all the weapons and everything and nothing could touch them, would you see people flow into Donbass or out of Donbass? And if out of Donbass, would they flow out of Donbass and go to Russia or would they flow out of Donbass and go to Ukraine? Because you can tell a lot about the situation just by seeing where people would naturally move if there was nothing restricting them. But that Russian military presence there is what's keeping them there. It would naturally get away from Russia's capture of them in that area. Okay, so he's talking about it, but it's actually what Russia is doing where eight to 10 million people live and hold these territories along with the population that hates them. Wait a minute, the population actually largely is sympathetic toward Ukraine, not toward Russia, especially since the 2022 invasion. People who by no means consider themselves to be of the same culture with them, who are no longer of the same faith and who speak a different language. Okay, so no longer same culture because you're Russian. Is that, I mean, is that what you're talking about? Of the same faith because you're now no longer part of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchy? I mean, is, is that what you're talking about? Or no longer speaks the same language. Most Ukrainians could also speak Russian and spoke Russian regularly and didn't think anything of it before 2022. And now they're really not liking Russian. Okay. They think they can occupy it. How many wardens can they appoint per capita? Well, so here's one of those really weird inverse mirroring kind of things. Can Russia do that? Because Russia is going to have to do that because if they withdrew their troops, it wouldn't work. I mean, the system would seize up that they're trying to hold because people would flee. Ah, uh, they're hoping everyone will move away. They understand that if they enter this territory, what expects them there is war. No, he, I mean, like, I don't even know where he's getting this idea from. Like, there are some loyalists. The further east you go, the, the higher the percentage, there, there are some loyalists who want to be part of Russia. But for the most part, it's not like that at all. But he's deceived by his own propaganda, I think. Guerrilla warfare, a civil war. It never was a civil war. It was a Russian inspired war, which used Ukrainians in order to meet Russian political objectives. This is the worst case scenario. More than that, they would have to win over those who hate them, those who made a choice not to live with them, and those who are used to another level of living standards. Wait a minute, you're talking about Russia. Now, I know that Russia has a slightly higher living standard than uh, Ukraine does statistically, but that's because there's a concentration in urban centers, but half the country in Russia, I mean, they're, they're really like back a century ago in their living standards using outhouses still. The living standards in Russia are incomparably higher, but they're saying that even that is not enough. They say they have to deal with a strategic defeat to Russia. This way, they are anticipating that Russia will disappear. It will cease to exist. Okay, now, here's that schizophrenic stuff I'm talking about. Russia is so awesome, and yet they're just, they just want to destroy us. Why do they want to destroy us? With the help of either Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, or Poland. Now, it's interesting that he mentions the Baltic states. Latvia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia were all absorbed into the Soviet Union proper. Poland was pulled in under the orbit of the Warsaw Pact, right? But none of them wanted to be there. See, that's the thing. Like, you keep talking about them as if they're yours. You're like a, like a jealous boyfriend. Your girlfriend left you, and yet you just keep coming after her, even though she doesn't want to have anything to do with you. They want to occupy Russia to a certain extent. No, they, they don't want to occupy Russia. They want to stop Russia from being the neighborhood bully because that's what's going on. Like if you just look from where what's going on in the world, these are countries that Russia has either Russia or the USSR has invaded at some point. The pink is Russia. They fought in the yellow. Okay. And all these red countries are countries that Russia has invaded at some point or the USSR has invaded at some point. Like that's, that's a, that's a pretty, and it's even worse because this is in the last hundred years, just the last hundred years, this is what Russia or the Soviet Union has done, right? So they, they don't want to 
invade Russia. They just want you to stop being Russia, being like that. They want to occupy Russia to the point that Russia statehood will vanish. Again, they're always like this, we're awesome, but we're always under attack. We're so big, but the world's going to try to take our stuff. I, it's this weird schizophrenia. How did those in the West imagine this scenario? They formulated it very simply, that Russia will disintegrate, that political collapse will cause a military collapse. Okay, um, some are saying that, some are not saying that, but as far as the political collapse causing a military collapse, I, that's, that's where my money is, that either a political or economic trigger will cause the end of the war, not so much the fighting. Their logic was generally very simple. How did World War I end? With Russia's military defeat? No. It ended with Russia's political defeat with a change of government. Is this possible or not? They were certain that the opposition that exists in Russia against the backdrop of an economic collapse and the discontent of the masses, they were certain that opposition, in which they've invested so much money, would achieve the goal. Then they would celebrate the repeat of 1991 to 1993. And this, this is what I'm talking about. They're always going back to this... It's like they have like low self-esteem. They're always going back to, oh, not another 1991 to 1993. I get it that that was a rough time after the dissolution of the Soviet Union. I understand that. In fact, Putin talks about how the dissolution of the Soviet Union is the greatest tragedy of the 20th century. No, the Soviet Union was the greatest tragedy of the 20th century. And that beat Hitler. Like, right? I mean, in just sheer killing power, the Soviet Union was the greatest tragedy. Now, they go back to this and say, well, that's what they want to do to us because we're the greatest. And yet at the same time, they're always trying to get us. It didn't work. In reality, we are doomed to victory in this war. What a turn of phrase. Because if you do win this war, you will be doomed and you will be repeating another war within about 20 years. So doomed to victory is actually the right term, even though he's wrong about that they are destined to win this war. Let's imagine a worst case scenario. The very worst scenario, God forbid, the continuity of government in Russia is guaranteed. An entire generation of leaders was raised up. Wait, so what are you talking about? Putin's gone here, but he's not saying it. He's smart enough to not do that. An entire generation of leaders was raised up and came to power in Russia. These leaders are highly professional and patriotic, and they embezzle like the day is long. They are team players. We see the continuity of power in leadership for several steps ahead, according to their age and their positions. So he's delusional here that he thinks that everything's just like we didn't know until 2022 when the Russian army performed so poorly just how eaten up it was from the inside by corruption. But now, we, now we're seeing this writ large on the world stage. And then he finishes with this, Ukraine is returning to its historically natural path of laying in ruins. And that's how he finishes his monologue. But that's not their historically natural path. In fact, it was Ukraine that birthed Russia, not the other way around. And yet he can't seem to see that or appreciate what Ukrainians are. Okay. That's what I mean by he's schizophrenic. He says this, and then he says that simultaneously. And it's like, how, how can you hold these two things at the same time? Tell me what you think. Am, am I right about my thesis? I think I am, but maybe I'm missing something. Put it in the comments below. Thank you for the time, the likes, the shares, the subscribes. And thank you for being the kind of person that cares about Ukraine.